Conservative author, editor, and commentator Jonah Goldberg has made a name for himself through book titles like Liberal Fascism, through his syndicated column, and his work as editor of the National Review Online. Recently, he sat down with NMIF producer Matt Grubbs to talk about compromise and the sweltering political climate in our nation's sweltering capital. Jonah Goldberg is an author, conservative commentator, editor-at-large of the National Review Online, in addition to a number of other things. You appear weekly in the Albuquerque Journal. Um, I want to start by just asking you if you can define our political climate or characterize it for us. Um, sure. First of all, thanks for having me here. Of course, I'm of course. Glad to be here. Uh, um, I'd say our political climate, the only reason I'm hesitating is because uh, I'm going to describe it as polarized and all these kinds of things. I'm not sure that's pejorative, right? Because there's okay. a lot of people out there who think it's terrible. We're hearing this constantly about how the spirit of compromise is gone and it, things are so much less civil and all of that. And I, I think there's some truth to that. Uh, things um, are pretty raw, particularly in Washington these days politically. Um, and we are very polarized. But um, I think one of the reasons why we're polarized is because is that we're reaching a moment of of some fundamental choices about the, the nature of our government, the nature of our politics, the future of our country. And there are people with deep-seated and profound disagreements on those questions. And it is inevitable that rhetoric get heated and things get a little uncivil under, under these kinds of situations because the stakes are really high. Sure. I, we had um, Sam Donaldson in here uh, a few weeks back, and he, he defined politics as the art of the possible. And he said it's just, it seems to be something of a lost art lately because there's, there's no middle ground, and we're at a point where um, essentially nothing gets done except on an ad hoc basis, and we have these budget bills that gets passed you know, every four months or something like that. Is that, um, is that concerning, or do you feel like it's not permanent, that it's not some sort of stasis? Um, I, first of all, I don't think it's permanent, and I think it's, um, you know, I, mean, I, I could certainly get into a fairly partisan you know, blame game thing about how President Obama has governed and all that, and I'm glad to get into it if you'd like. But I think, you know, one of the ways to think about it is uh, there's a fascinating new article in a journal called National Affairs, which is sort of an egg journal, and by a uh, <coughs> writer named Jay Cost. And the title of it is called The Politics of Loss. And one of the points that he makes is that since World War II, we've had such prosperity in this country, such growth, that um, politics wasn't zero sum. I could give you what you wanted, and I could also give someone else what they wanted, um, and it wouldn't cost anybody, right? Um, and we are now, because of the exploding deficit, debt, um, the lack of growth, we are, that period seems to be coming to an end. And where, so now, if I give Joe something, it means I'm taking it away from John. And uh, politics are becoming zero sum. And for Democrats to win on their issues means Republicans have to lose on their issues, and vice versa. And uh, we saw that and how it played out in Wisconsin. Um, uh, that is sort of, I think, the nature of politics for a while now, and it just follows that it's going to be nastier. Um, uh, the, moreover, I think that the sort of quest to just have um, compromise for compromise's sake is sort of ridiculous. Um, if I say 2 plus 2 is 4 and you say 2 plus 2 is 10, I don't think it's a huge step forward if we settle to agree at 6. And um, uh, so much of, of what we mean by compromise in Washington is basically for, uh, by my lights, conservatives and libertarians who are deeply concerned about the, the future of this country to basically cave in on their principles and their objections, uh, their objectives, and agree to the fundamental assumptions of Democrats about the size and scope of government. And I, I don't think that's sustainable anymore. A lot of people on the left would say, if you look at, um, for example, how the Obama administration handled health care, that he caved too much on, on his fundamental principles of how that system should operate um, and that it's, that it's swung the other way. It does, does it happen on both sides? Sure. Um, um, you know, the thing is, I mean, part of the problem is, is I think, well, I think you're right that the left would say philosophically Obamacare is a big compromise, right? Politically, it was not. Uh, you know, uh, Senator Patrick Moynihan used to say, in terms of welfare reform, you cannot, and, and health care under Hillary Clinton in the Clinton administration, so you can't pass sweeping new social changes on a partisan basis. And uh, obviously there's a lot of blame to go around <coughs> about who is being the most partisan and all the rest, and the conventional wisdom is the Republicans. But I think one of the problems you had with Obamacare was that Obama basically decided he was going to negotiate with himself. 
and that was driven almost entirely by an internal conversation within the Democratic Party that the Republicans were largely locked out of. And so when they ended up having to pass it, it was almost an entirely a Democratic creature um, with a very few Republican votes. And it never won a consensus of, of support in the country at large. And um, so those compromises that he may have made, he made you know on his own with the left. He didn't make them in terms of with the Republican Party. He didn't meet with them in negotiations. He certainly didn't negotiate on the stimulus. And so a lot of, I think, that the poisonous atmosphere we have in Washington stems from the fact that President Obama had these huge majorities in Congress when he first came in, got his agenda, and imposed it on, on the Republicans without getting a buy-in from them. And, and I personally think he would be in so much better shape today if he had gotten that buy-in. You know, on the stimulus, if he had gotten the Republicans on board with it, and I, th I certainly think he could have. Really? Absolutely. I mean, people play this movie backwards and they say, oh, the Republicans are so partisan today, right? One of the reasons why they're so partisan is because how the stimulus was done. I think the stimulus was the undoing of the Obama presidency. Uh, you talk to Republicans on Capitol Hill at the beginning of the Obama presidency, they were terrified that Obama was going to give him half a loaf on the stimulus. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't that they thought they were going to get all the Republicans on board, but they could easily have gotten 20, 30, 40 percent of the Republicans. People forget Obama was at 70 plus pr approval ratings back then. But they got so greedy with the way they did it, they didn't negotiate with the Republicans in good faith, at least how the Republicans saw it. And you know, people say, oh, Obama put in tax cuts and all that kind of stuff. No, he put in sort of spending through the tax code, tax breaks for activity that he liked. He didn't put in any of the kind of tax cuts that the Republicans wanted. And so the, Republic so the Democrats got very greedy on that. They passed the stimulus without Republicans. And what the Republicans learned from that was that they could vote against Obama and gain politically for it, um, that they would be rewarded by their own voters. Um, you know, if, 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 if Republicans had done that to LBJ at the beginning of the Great Society, you know, the leader of the Republicans would have woken up with, their, with his favorite horse's head in his bed. Um, but <laughs> it was a much different Republican Party it, back then. It's sure, too. but it just it set the tone in Washington that the Republicans could defy Obama and not be punished for it and not hurt for it and stand on their principles. And it created this environment where that the Democrat, that Obama took from that, well, if the Republicans are going to be like this, I don't need them. And so uh, sort of a failure of strategy, but did necessarily the, I mean, we look at those reports that said um, that essentially this $800 million um, stimulus was recommended by some people to be $1.4 trillion, sure. $1.6 trillion. Um, can you say that, that that was the imprudent thing to do at that point, that it would have been better to do like the 1.4, the 1.6? You could certainly make that argument that uh, if you believe in the Keynesian assumptions, right, that <clears throat> this is what the economy needed and all that. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not entirely clear. I think one of the other problems with the stimulus was that the way it was structured is it wasn't structured to put money directly into people's hands. It was structured to bail out state governments, bail out state public sector unions, um, to fund all these green energy boondoggles, to pay for uh, these shovel-ready jobs that didn't exist, which Obama's even admitted he didn't exist. Um, even you know, supply-siders or, or free market economists would have thought you would have gotten a bigger balance from dumping a trillion dollars into the economy than we did, but I think the stimulus was structured as a payoff for the parts of the Democratic coalition. Um, I favored at the time, if we're going to do a stimulus, basically having a payroll tax holiday, just letting, you know, put a trillion dollars straight into the pockets of, of workers, no compliance, no paperwork, just do it straight that, like that. There were a lot of Republicans who would have supported that. Uh, Newt Gingrich was touting it at the time. But the Obama administration wanted to do this top-down kind of thing where we're going we're gonna to design a solution from above. And I, so I think it was poorly designed, it was poorly impl implemented. And one thing that you'll hear, even from Democrats on Capitol Hill, is the Obama White House has a terrible relationship with Congress. It never cultivated Congress. It basically cultivated Nancy Pelosi and Harry Reid, and that was it. And so once the Republicans took over the House, they had no operation for how to work with, with, with the institution, never mind the other party. But it was sort of a, you know, you look at the folks on the left, and they're saying, look, it's turnabout is fair play. I mean, we had nothing in the second term of the Bush presidency, and there was no way for us to approach him, and they just governed around us. Well, you know, first of all, I mean, look, the Democrats took back the... People forget that the economy really started to get bad after the Democrats took back the Congress in 2006. You know, but, but, you, but this idea that, that economics happens and there's this immediate impact, that's absolutely wrong. Well, I, I don't think it's absolutely wrong, but I think you're right. It's deeply flawed. I, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not trying to make that sense, but you, you hear that, these talking points about how it was all on Bush's watch. Um, and if you're going to do that kind of political causation, you know, correlation game, you actually have to look at who was running what. And at the time, regardless, my only point was that, um, look, I mean, Bush 
was a paragon of compromise and, and bipartisanship compared to President Obama. Bush's first priority when he came into office was to work with Ted Kennedy on No Child Left Behind. Right, which um, Ted Kennedy had many of the same complaints that I've heard you talk about Ronald Reagan having with, uh, with some of the tax um, increases that he had, which was, where were those spending cuts? Ted Kennedy essentially said, wait a second, we came up with this plan, where's the money to do it? Which is why you're seeing yeah, what's I mean, going like, on with the American education but, but, system. Well, birds got to fly, fish got to swim, Ted Kennedy's got to complain about insufficient funding of federal programs. Um, uh, the idea that the problems with the American educational system are a direct result of, of lack of federal funding is a really problematic one by my lights. Uh, you know, Bush increased spending on education by 58% on his watch. But it's not just a lack of federal funding, it's where that funding is being pushed. Because there is, as you said, there is federal funding flowing into schools. Um, certainly all our property taxes uh -huh. pay for it, that sort of thing. Um, and, and I think there's both parties would agree there's a whole lot of room for improvement in, uh, in sure. our education system. Uh, but you can't look at, um, at No Child Left Behind and say that it, was, it did what it was supposed to do because the money no, wasn't look, I wasn't a huge fan of No Child Left Behind, but it was certainly bipartisan. It was certainly, he certainly worked, on, worked at it with Democrats. Uh, he got, you know, Bush got votes for almost all of his signature stuff. Um, well, not, I shouldn't say all of it, but a lot of the signature programs were bipartisan. Bush came into office as a as sort of a non-fire breathing conservative. He was a compassionate conservative. Um, you know, he, he expanded government. He spent enormously on education. Um, he, you know, the votes for the war, <coughs> despite all of the hullabaloo, were were bipartisan votes. I mean, President Obama's Secretary of State and Vice President both voted for the Iraq War. Um, Bush was much better at working with. Um, Democrats than Obama has been at working with Republicans, and um, but yeah, no, look, I, mean, I agree with you. There's all this who started it and all all these kinds of games, and there are responses to everything I've said, and that's fine. But at the end of the day, my my larger point is the tone in Washington, regardless of the partisan blame game thing, represent it reflects deep and serious um, disagreement, philosophical disagreements, um, mathematical disagreements that can't be overcome simply in the spirit of compromise. Um, one side, in a sense, needs to win and one side needs to lose. And you know, Jim DeMint says, hey, look, I'm all in favor of compromise, but the Democrats need to compromise with us about how much to cut, not how much to spend. And that's, that is a, an argument that you cannot solve. Um, you, know, you, you either have to agree that we are in an age of austerity and we need to cut spending, or we're not in an age of austerity and we need to increase spending. And you can't, you can't find a middle ground between those two perspectives. As you look at what's to come um, in December with automatic cuts um, that a, a lot of people sort of look at those and go, yeah, right, kind of a yeah. thing. Um, should, those, should those go in, into place? Technically, no. You don't think so? Um, um, well, I, I just think it's going to be a huge, and it depends on what's going on in Europe, but it'd be just an enormous financial blow to have, you know, as even Bill Clinton has said, have all these tax, cut, tax <coughs> hikes go into effect. and have these devastating cuts to, to the defense budget and all that. Um, I would rather not see those things happen. I would rather have, you know, a, a legitimate compromise along the lines of the one that Obama's debt commission proposed, you know, the, the Simpson-Bowles commission. Uh, I didn't agree with everything in there, but the basic principles I thought were pretty sound and pretty serious. And, um, uh, but the Democratic Party has rejected that, <coughs> or at least, excuse me, at least Barack Obama rejected that because it would have required um, going to his own base and saying, you know, the the politics of zero sum, you know, the, the politics of pleasing everybody are over. And that's, and I agree with him on that, but he didn't have the courage to actually sell that message to his own party. When you look at what Simpson Bowles came up with, um, can our budget be reined in without somehow fundamentally cutting the um, funding for our defense? I mean, you look at sort of that big, pie there, and it, I don't see how it can be done. Now, I'm not in Washington running the budget or running the country, but... Yeah, no, look, I, I'm sort of an outlier on this. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm willing to contemplate, I mean, I, I think sweeping defense cuts, you know, just, I mean, I, I can't stand this, we need 10% across the board everywhere kind of approach. Okay. That's we don't do that in our home budgets, right? We don't say, well, I'm going to cut 10% off of my cable, 10% off of my food, 10% off of... Uh, you know, my cleaning products. I mean, some things you it's have to pay for. What can you it. live with that? Right. And so I wish, I mean, I'd like to see, I mean, the Defense Department has been doing major cuts all along. 
um, and it has been shrinking quite a bit already. But uh, I understand why you look at it and you look at the, the needs we have around the world and you can see that there's got to be some cuts there and, and I, I, I am open to that. But um, the real money is to be found in entitlements, right? I mean, that's just the simple fact of it. It's Medicare and Medicaid and, um, and that seems to me is where you could have really innovative government and um, innovation seems to scare the dickens out of the sort of entrenched classes in Washington. Jonah Goldberg, thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it.